Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I know we still have people joining, but in the interest of time, we'll just kick off. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations in this country, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to live, and to meet in this territory. My name is Maggie Fairs, and on behalf of Business and Arts, I want to thank you all for joining us today. We are delighted to welcome back Nick Nanos from Nanos Research, who will share the findings from the second arts tracking survey. This is a partnership between Business and Arts, Nanos Research, and the National Arts Centre. For today's discussion, we'll be focusing on the philanthropic trends amongst Canadian culture goers. Following Nick's presentation, we'll have a national response panel who will discuss findings, who will discuss these findings in more detail and share how their organizations have adjusted their current fundraising and programming to meet these challenges. We're thrilled also to have Camilla Holland, Executive Director of the Royal Winnipeg Theatre Centre as our moderator for today's session. As always, we'll have time for Q&A. I will ask you to share your questions in the question box just on the bottom of your screen. We'll use a poll to um, make sure that we ask the most popular questions from everyone on the group. Also, we'll be recording today's session and we'll be housing this on the Business and Arts website. You can find all the sessions we've hosted to date there. We've done quite a few since March, so I really do encourage you to take a look. So with that, let me turn it over to Nick, who can walk us through the findings. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Maggie. And hello, everyone. And Maggie, can you give me a thumbs up just to say that everyone can see my screen? It's kind of like one of those phobias. There you go. We're good. Super. We're good. So, thanks. So we're going to do a walkthrough. Uh, the second wave of the Arts Response Tracking Survey. It's comprised of 760 Canadians who are culture goers, which means that they've attended a cultural event sometime over the past uh, 12 months. And uh, the other thing is, is that this is accurate plus or minus 3.6 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. Basically in this study, uh, our, we had three primary priorities. First of all, examining the timing of the return of, uh, of patrons and culture goers. Second, examining the conditions uh, that would make them comfortable returning. And then the new content uh, that we're putting on the table today has to do with donations, unpacking what has happened in the past uh, year and what will happen in the coming 2021. And you know what's interesting is that uh, when we ask uh, culture goers about uh, donating, to cultural organizations, you can see that 43%, uh, about four out of every 10 reported to have uh, donated in 2019. Fairly similar numbers in terms of, uh, of what I'll say, the proportion of culture goers that, uh, that do donate. But uh, you can see in 2019, 2020, and 2021, basically a variation in what people are reporting that they gave, are giving, and will give. So. On average, $158 back in, in 2019. In 2020, you can see based on our estimates, at least people are reporting about a 20% reduction in donations to uh, arts and cultural organizations. Uh, the good news is, is that for 2021, if people deliver on what they say they would like to deliver, that uh, there could be a bit of a rebound. But the key takeaway here is that uh, there's negative pressure on donations, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, and that we should expect at least a 20% drop in donations this year, but that uh, there is intent or positive impressions at least in terms of what people would like to do, culture goers would like to do when it comes to financially supporting arts and cultural organizations in 2021. There's some interesting variations based on age, and we also know that age in this particular environment not only correlates many times with income, but it also correlates with stability of income. And uh, key takeaway here is that if you happen to be an arts and culture goer over the age of 55, you're more likely to give this year uh, compared to younger arts and culture goers. Uh, but uh, take a look at those 2021 numbers. You know, what it looks like is that uh, that middle age cohort is most likely to be squeezed when it comes to donations and not being as generous as they have in the past, where both this year and next year they're giving less. You can see them, those millennials, younger patron go, patrons of the of arts and culture wanting to give a little more in 21, but check out that number of the 55 plus and the projected or what they say they will give or want to give in 2021. $373, that's a 109% increase 
basically uh, significantly up from the uh, from their base year of 2020. And uh, it speaks to this particular cohort being kind of what I'll say a foundational group uh, when it comes to donations. So the key takeaway on the donation front is there will be a hit this year and we all know that, but there is an opportunity potentially depending on the environment, the economic environment and the environment related to COVID. There's, there's a, an opportunity at least for there to be a potential rebound in donations next year. And those rebound in donations are gonna be among older patrons who are uh, long serving supporters of the uh, arts and culture community. Um, when it comes to precautions, many of, the, uh, many of the precautions that people in the unprompted question, which means they could say whatever they wanted, were uh, reasonably similar. But what we, did, uh, what we did see was a market increase in the citation of masks as, uh, as a precaution that would help make people feel more comfortable. And you know, one way to think of this is that uh, people take guidance from the public health authorities. When the public health authority says that social distancing is important to occur, they respect that. When they, we saw messaging from public health authorities now, which was different than in May, where in May uh, masks were recommended, but uh, not compulsory in many instances. Fast forward to now, we're in an environment where masks in most jurisdictions and places compulsory in public places indoors and we can see that people are taking uh, taking the lead from the public health authorities when it comes to uh, masks so uh, that's the key takeaway uh, from the the amount of precautions when we look overall on the intention to return uh, we can still see that for indoor cultural activities about one out of every four uh, arts and culture goers are ready to return immediately with uh, masks and physical distancing being kind of the key priorities. The other thing is, is more than one out of every three are still unsure. And check out those numbers related to vaccines. You can see for the people that want to wait, 52% cite vaccines as something that they want to see, 40% among those that are unsure. Vaccine continuing to be a key signal. If there's any progress on a vaccine or as vaccines get rolled out, you could probably expect a greater number of uh, Canadian arts and culture goers to feel comfortable about coming back to those activities and events that they so love. On the outdoor front, uh, when it comes to outdoor cultural activities, no big surprise. Uh, those Canadians that are ready to immediately turn are a little higher. And uh, for them, it's more about physical distancing than uh, masks when it comes to what makes them feel comfortable. But the fact of the matter is, is that still a significant one third of uh, arts and culture goers for outdoor cultural activities uh, remain uh, unsure. For museums and galleries, about three out of every 10 are ready to immediately return. And you can see a combination of masks and physical distancing for those that are ready to immediately uh, go back to museums and galleries uh, for that experience but uh, still a significant proportion of, uh, of Canadians who go to museums and galleries report being unsure and uh, either masks or physical distancing being kind of like the one, two uh, that people are expecting on that front. So key takeaways. Uh, first of all, there is an intent for Canadian culture goers to be more generous in 2021, but we need to put a big asterisk beside that. First of all, uh, we don't know what the state of the pandemic will be in 2021. Second of all, we don't know what the state of the economy will be in 2021. And third of all, and I think this is important, not just for the arts and culture sector, but for the charitable sector writ large. We don't know what the conditions will be that might encourage more Canadians to support charities, whether they be in the arts and cultural sector or in any sector writ large. And that might be something that should be part of the discussion. What are the conditions or what could the government do to create an environment for Canadians to give the way they want to give and to support through charitable donations, arts and cultural uh, organizations. And it looks like the foundational element through all of this will be patrons and supporters of the arts uh, that are a little older, have more stable income, probably longer relationships uh, with organizations and that it looks like the one cohort that is being squeezed or sandwiched is the middle age cohort. Those individuals that probably not only have kids, but they're looking after their parents, they're still in the workforce 
and there's a significant level of uncertainty. So see that particular cohort as being at risk, but then look at that 55 plus cohort as a key opportunity, especially for 2021. On the, uh, on the return or the normalization, if normalization is the right word, uh, you can see basically that uh, the, the desire or the appetite for masks has been on the rise and continues to be very strong. Uh, we can also see that, uh, that vaccines are kind of in the background as people are waiting and could be a significant motivator and accelerator if there's uh, movement on the vaccine front. Um, but we have to think of as masks as part of the, I don't know what the right word is, but the, the new culture of attendance for culture and arts uh, performances and, uh, and experiences. So key takeaways. First of all, there will be a hit in, uh, in 2020. Second of all, there's an opportunity in 2021 among uh, patron and supporters that are over 55 years of age, but expect those middle-aged patrons to feel the squeeze. Third, still a significant number of Canadians are unsure when they're gonna wanna return, vaccines being a key signal, but for those that are ready to return now, masks at the top of the list in order to make them feel comfortable. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back over to Maggie. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nick. Those are really interesting findings and I'm sure our response panel is gonna have a lot to say about it. So Camilla, I would love to have you now um, introduce you to start our discussion. Thanks so much, Maggie. Um, thank you, Nick, for sharing those high level findings with us. Just a reminder to everybody on the joining today that um, all that data will be on the Business for the Arts website. In fact, I think it might be there now for digging into the minutia and the, the granularity by region. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome my fellow panelists to the Zoom room. Um, so I'm assuming, Maggie, that you can make that happen or Monica on the back end. Uh, we have five great uh, panelists joining us from across Canada, bringing perspectives to this data and how it's informing their strategies on a go forward basis. And so I'm going to introduce them individually and allow them to introduce themselves and ask them a provocative question. So first up, I've got Wesley. Um, I'm only seeing my screen, but I'm going to assume that the rest of the world is seeing the right piece of this until somebody texts me otherwise. So Wesley, the, the Globe and Mail did this fantastic, hello, the, West, the Globe and Mail did a fantastic article about the innovative way you and the Highland Arts Theatre have created in this pandemic time to deeply inspire donors, keep artists engaged, and frankly, keep your doors open. Will you tell us that success story? Sure, I'd love to, and thanks. thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Wesley Colford. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm coming live from beautiful Cape Breton. Uh, we're currently about to be hit by a hurricane, so if I disappear suddenly, that might be why. Um, but we, we've had, like everybody, just um, the most outrageous roller coaster of a year. And there's a lot, uh, obviously, that, that has happened. So I'm going to try to be very brief. But if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can find my, my contact on our website, highlandartstheater.com. And you can certainly read lots about uh, everything that's, that's radical access. So um, like everybody, I'm sure, uh, we were hit by this pandemic completely unexpected. We are a very young theater company. Um, we're based in Sydney. In Nova Scotia, we've we're, we just celebrated our sixth year anniversary. We're two years as a charity, so um, we have, we're in a bit of a unique position because we have no ongoing government operational funding, and almost all of our revenue, keeping the doors open, let alone our programming, has come through ticket sales over the past six years. So, with no events and no ticket sales, we are in a very bleak situation. Um, like so many of us, we were, we were expecting in April that we would be bankrupt by the end of August 2020. So we had a very, very immediate timeline and uh, a huge incentive that uh, we had to come up with something that would that would save our, our organization. Um, I'm happy to say that that did not happen as projected. And in fact, in less than three months, we've been able to raise almost $600,000 thanks to this program we developed called Radical Access. So um, the way the, the way this has worked, it's it's a combination of several models I've been talking about, thinking about, planning about, and then they all came together. Um, essentially, it's a crowdsourcing model. So we're asking for people instead of instead of buying tickets, we're asking people to commit to ongoing monthly donations, twenty five dollars more or less, whatever they can afford, 
And the idea being, if we can create a critical mass of at least $50,000 of donations every month, that represents less than 50% of our budget, but it would be enough to make sure we can hit all of our hard uh, budget operational expenses and at least some level of programming as well. Um, and I'm delighted to say we are currently at 98% of that goal, which is just uh, absolutely extraordinary. Um, the way it worked, like any of you that are familiar with uh, crowdsourcing, GoFundMe, Patreon, those sorts of models, um, we had a series of, of tier pledges. So we said, if we can get to $10,000 a month, we'll do this. If we get to 20, we'll do this. Um, you can, again, you can look at our website for the whole list. There's a whole bunch of really exciting things. Basically, we try to think of what are all the things we wanted to provide for our community that we couldn't afford to necessarily. And we're going to lump it under this single umbrella of radical access. So instead of fundraising for one thing or another thing, we're going to put it all in and then tier it depending on how the success uh, occurs. Uh, that includes things like scholarships for our education program for youth, ASL interpretation for our performances. We have a $10,000 commission contest for BIPOC artists in Canada. Uh, there's all, all kinds of stuff. So you can look at all of that. But the, the sort of pinnacle of that is if we get to 100%, we would provide all 12 main stage theatrical productions free of charge, not just for donors, but for everyone in the community. So essentially this, this fundraising, it's replacing that main stage ticket revenue that we were so reliant on and instead substituting this donation. So essentially we know we're getting it in advance, meaning we can just budget for it. It's consistent, no matter what happens with the pandemic, we have backups. So if we have to go digital, if we have to go online, if we have to become more of an audio programming base, those are all built in. And it, it means that in lieu of operational funding from the government, we have the steady increase of donations for which we're able to of course provide a tax receipt. So it's it's really win-win for everybody. People who are regular donor, or sorry, people who are regular ticket goers at our theater uh, are able to donate in lieu of buying tickets. It means that they'll get a tax receipt so they're paying much less, even if they decide to donate more. And then um, as a result, we get to know we can survive. And this has been uh, really the only reason that we're able to still be here today in, in mid-September. So um, it's been it's been pretty incredible. Um, we have an amazingly supportive community and that's that's been a huge part of it, obviously. Um, but we've also people across the country and across the continent. We, like Camilla mentioned, we had a great article in the Cape Breton Post. We were mentioned in the New York Times. We think we're the first company in Canada to take on this model, certainly at this scale. Um, like I said, our, our budget's around $1.2 million and half of that will be coming from radical access for 2020 and 2021 and hopefully forever ongoing. Um, so it's, it's, it's incredible. We are definitely at an advantage um, compared to many people being in the East Coast. We're currently part of the Atlantic bubble and uh, apparently we're one of the safest places in Canada right now, or, or certainly, sorry, certainly in Canada, the world apparently. So we've actually been able to resume our programming at a very limited level starting in August. We had two shows that were running in repertoire, um, including House by Daniel McIver, who we actually got to uh, put on our stage, Daniel McIver himself. He's from Cape Breton. Uh, he was supposed to be at Stratford for eight months. Because of the pandemic, that didn't happen. And so he was able to be home quarantining, to be closer to his mom. And so we were able to put him on stage, which was pretty incredible. So um, again, that, that's an advantage that I know a lot of people right now are struggling with. And I, I am so uh, sympathetic to the fact that the virus is, is rearing up again in so many parts of Canada. Um, but Again, I know lots of people are doing really innovative things digital uh, with digital content. Eventually, we'll all be able to do some version of live performances. And this was a way that, again, even though we, we could do live shows, we are currently at 12% capacity with physical distancing. So let's say we, we were able to do shows, but using a similar model to what we've done previously, there's no way we'd even be able to break even on the performances, let alone pay any of the operational costs. So again, this is a way to supersede that reliance on ticket sales and ask the community what's important. Is this something that you believe in? Do you think that we should have a theater in our community? Um, and well, more importantly- They're demonstrating so clearly that they do. Well, yes, I yes, that, that's <laughs> been the wonderful thing. Um, and, but and I think the key to that too, though, is that it's not just people paying, like, I mean, essentially that'd be a subscription service if they're paying and then they get free tickets. That was something we originally were talking about. What really was the game changer was this idea of radical access being, yes, you can be a donor and you can get tickets, but also everybody can get tickets. So it becomes something more akin to the public library or the CBC, even though we're not government funded, 
we have this critical mass that say theater is essential and everybody should be able to see what we can provide and, and be able to do that with our performances, but then also this whole other list. So again, uh, that's a lot of information. Feel free if anyone wants to reach out if they have more questions, but um, it, it's it's been revolutionary for us. And I hope it can be an example for other theaters and other arts organizations across the country or across the world, because we think we've all learned that theater and, and the arts and music, all of these things are so necessary. It's been what's kept so many of us uh, engaged and, and invigorated through a horrible, horrible six months. And if we can find a way that we're paying our expenses, we're paying our artists better than we've ever paid them, but we're also able to create content that's free for the entire community, that to me seems like the future. And that's something that we are so excited to be leading the way with in the East Coast. Thanks so much, Wesley. It's an extraordinary story. I think it, it's so um, beautifully highlights coming some of the um, the opportunities out of the pandemic in terms of leaning into relevance to community engagement and, and making yourselves really central to that conversation. So congratulations. I'm going to keep us moving through our panelists. Next up, I've got Irfan, um, who will put his camera on and join us. Uh, in our prep, you made this impassioned case that while the prospect of fundraising numbers rebounding in 2021 was a great win, and a, and a win we're all counting on, it won't help address the fundamental challenges facing larger arts organizations, including high hidden fixed costs. Can you take us through your thought process and what beyond this potential fundraising growth we can look forward to will need to survive this grand intermission? Great, thank you, uh, Camila, for that question. And I'm sure we're all thinking about that same question. Uh, as uh, Camila mentioned, my name is Irfan and I'm in Calgary and I am the board chair of Glenbow Museum. Um, in my day job, I'm a business owner and investor. And so I sort of think about the challenges that are facing different sectors of the economy on a daily basis, not just the arts or nonprofits, but also business. And I'm concerned, um, you know, yesterday I was just out on 17th Avenue here in Calgary, which is close to our home. And, you know, saw probably about 30% of the retail and restaurants uh, that are around our neighborhood uh, have shut down. Uh, and the reason that they shut down, which is terrible, and I'm sure this is true in multiple communities across the country, is that there are high fixed costs in restaurants. If you think about just their lease costs, uh, and you can only you know, either turn on the restaurant and you pay the lease or you don't. And if you can't afford that fixed cost, then you shut down. And I think there's analogs in the nonprofit world for that. If I think about, you know, a theater, you either have a show or you don't, like you can't do half a show. And so, you know, there's, you know, very high operating leverage uh, in our industry as well. And I think that that creates the same risk that we see for retail and restaurants. Um, the thing that's more concerning for me though, is I do believe that when we get to the other side of this pandemic and there is a vaccine and we, you know, go back to maybe not normal, but to a place where we're able to, to go out and be together again, whether that's at restaurants or in, uh, in, in the theater or in art museums like at Glenbow. Um, I think that when that happens, replacing the restaurants a lot easier, in my opinion, I mean, it's terrible that they're going out of business, but if you think about the barriers to entry to start a new restaurant in that same space, it's a lot easier than thinking about the hurdle that it is to start a new theater company or an art museum. And so if we lose these institutions, which I think are at risk of loss right now, um, I think they're a lot harder to replace. And I think that we will see longer and more permanent damage. So the question is, what do we do about it? Um, you know, we have innovative ideas and Wesley, congratulations on, on your idea of radical access. I think that's fantastic. Um, there's silver linings in some of the data that Nick presented to us. The fact that we do have people that have more stable balance sheets um, you know, that maybe have a bit more wealth or have paid off their mortgage and people that are 55 and older or more stable income, basically donating the same amount this year that they donated the last year. I think that's a huge positive. I think another huge positive is there's a massive amount of intent uh, amongst Canadians to support this sector. You see these numbers for next year going up dramatically, but that might be too little too late. And so, you know, to Nick's question at the beginning of, uh, of this, what can government do potentially? to help this sector, you know, make sure that we cross the chasm and get to the other side. You know, I've been really thinking a lot about that. Maybe there are a couple things. And so if there are people that have more stable balance sheets that have high intent to donate, how do we encourage them to donate more? You know, Camille, you and I were talking the other day about what uh, is going on in the UK with the restaurant industry. Again, 
an industry just like our industry that is uh, at risk of, of huge loss, uh, where the UK government's splitting the bill. Uh, so if you go out to a restaurant, I think it's Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, half the bill is paid by the government. And why I think that's interesting is because they've recognized that that's an industry with high fixed costs that needs support. But more importantly, they've decided that they're not going to pick winners and losers. They're not going to say we're going to save the keg, but we're not going to save, you know, Joey tomatoes or whatever. Um, they're allowing the public to pick what restaurants uh, matter to them. And I think that there's an analog in that for our government here. Uh, I think early on in the pandemic, they were starting to pick some charities. I think it's very hard. There's 80,000 registered charities uh, in the country. How do you decide? And I think the easiest way to decide is to actually let citizens decide. What if we created this year and next year a super tax credit where we said to people, you know, especially people that are in higher income tax brackets, they get 50% of their money back when they write a check. What if they got 75% back this year and next year uh, to encourage them to, to pull forward the donations that they're intending on making next year, which we've seen now very clearly in the data with big numbers, let's pull those donations forward into this year so that we actually do survive it. Because showing up with a $300 check next year for an institution that no longer exists, isn't that helpful. But maybe adding $50 to your donation this year such that we can get to next year could be very value added. And the beautiful thing about our sector is that if you think about those dollars going into the nonprofit sector, this isn't just for the arts. I mean, I think donors to the arts also donate to health and they donate to education. Uh, they donate to all sorts of causes. Um, I think the beautiful thing about this is that typically the nonprofit sector, a very large portion of where our money goes, goes to salaries. And it's not high income salaries. And we know that people that are earning in the lower half of income actually have a higher propensity to spend. And so a couple of things happen when you donate to charities like in the arts. First, more jobs are protected. That means that most of the money that uh, is actually now flowing will be respent in the economy because those people now have incomes to spend. And so it's actually economically generative. And the income tax also comes back to the government. So the true cost of this on a net basis is actually very, very low. But the benefit is massive. And a failure to act at this point in time, I think, could see the sector have, have real challenges. In fact, some of these things may no longer exist. So I, I think about that. I think about uh, potentially um, uh, looking at what we've done with uh, public uh, uh, companies and, um, and removing capital gains exemptions, not just for public company donations of shares, but private company donations of shares, which the art sector has been pushing for a long, long time. And we've seen be very additive on the public company share side. And the last thing is there is a headwind that we have to just be honest about. Uh, and I've seen this in other data, which is that the We Charity scandal has caused people to think twice about donating to charity because it's created a bit of a fog. And so it was the last thing we kind of needed right now. And, and I do think that it would be helpful if the government would say, hey, we recognize the challenge. We recognize we need to do something. We don't want to pick winners and losers, but we do think we have a, a path forward. And I think that looking at this data, it makes me think that with that, uh, you know, hopefully we can get to the other side. Great, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful ideas. And I know, of course, we have a number of people on our call today who wear their advocacy hats well, and I think it's great for them to be reminded of the, the, the argument that we can be making around this data moving forward. Um, I'm gonna welcome Monica. Monica, my friend and colleague from Toronto. Who, Monica, there's a ton of information in this survey about who in our audiences might be coming back when they might be coming back and what would make them comfortable. And I know you at Canadian Stage have just announced a tranche of fall programming, and I'm sure you're in the planning for the winter, the spring. What intelligence and experience can you share about shifting your organizational planning cycle, your usual announcements to something that's a bit more nimble, responsive? Sure, sure, happy to. Um, uh, my name is Monica Estevez, and I'm the executive director at Canadian Stage in Toronto. Um, well, from an information and data point perspective, um, back in June, Canadian Stage, um, we ran uh, pretty extensive third party conducted focus groups with our audiences. Um, we were looking for real time feedback uh, about the alternative programming that we were cooking up, uh, but we also wanted to get a sense of what was important to them, uh, how they were feeling about the pandemic, about a potential return inside of theaters, and just generally how the pandemic was affecting their lives. 
So the focus groups and uh, uh, other data points that we looked at uh, over the spring and summer months genuinely impacted and informed adjustments that we made uh, to our programming, to pricing and packaging, amongst other things. Um, but I'll, I'll point out a, a couple of areas in particular. Um, so one of the things that we heard loud and clear uh, and continue to hear is that they were worried about us. Uh, us being Canadian stage and arts organizations, but also great concern for artists and art workers in our communities who have been so terribly impacted uh, by this pandemic. So uh, we took that feedback and we took it as an opportunity, uh, perhaps even as an invitation uh, to create a conduit uh, between the individuals in our audience and the individuals in our theater and dance community. We've created these artist vouchers. Uh, so these are opportunities, vouchers for that our audiences and donors can purchase uh, that are tax receivable. Uh, and then we in turn direct 100% uh, direct them to uh, micro grants and other investments uh, that directly go into artists hands uh, as part of our, our uh, Canadian stages response to the pandemic this season. Um, so, and these artist vouchers are either built directly into some of our new passes um, or patrons can purchase them directly. So we are um, about three weeks into, uh, since our launch and so far the response is really positive. Um, in fact, as we attempt to migrate as many of our original subscribers as possible into our new pass holder program, uh, the artist vouchers are actually neck and neck with our pass holder sales. So, so far the, the results are really encouraging and, and that really uh, was born out of um, uh, the, the feedback that we, we solicited from our audiences. Uh, the other way uh, in which various data points have been really informative uh, was in our planning cycles and commitments. What we learned was that for most Canadian stage audiences, uh, at least back in June, but things can change, um, was that while a surprising number of them, surprising to me, would consider returning into a theater if the right safety conditions were in place, uh, that they weren't willing to commit to anything for at least a few months in the future. Uh, you know, the uncertainty of the times, of the pandemic, uh, the economy, et cetera. And frankly, as we started to look at our um, own internal controls and countless financial models that we were doing for the upcoming season and beyond, it became increasingly clear to us that our own ability to commit beyond a few months uh, would have intolerable levels of risk. So we are now moving forward with quarterly programming announcements for the short and medium term, uh, certainly for the, for the next 12 months and probably for as long as the pandemic is around and potentially into recovery period. Um, so this means that our board of directors is approving budgets only in three month tranches. Uh, it gives us the ability to program more responsibly. Uh, it gives us more time to gauge and respond to our fundraising efforts, which are so important. have never been more critical. Um, broader economic impacts of the pandemic um, and, and to, uh, uh, to what Ifran was saying about government, um, government action, what the government is going to do in the next 12 months. Um, Monica, I'm going to get you to distill any further thoughts just briefly so we can make sure we get to our two more panelists and also to the questions. But you're good? Yes. yes. It's, it, thank you so much, Monica. It's really, it's incredible to hear sort of about an organization that's been able to shift its culture to that more responsive piece within an institution. And I, I love the idea of your board approving things in kind of three month segments um, willingly. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, Claire, will you join us, please? Um, I'm coming to you with two questions and I'm going to squish you into three minutes with apologies. I know that Bard on the Beach has done significant summer engagement with donors who you would usually be welcoming into your tent. I'd love to, to hear a great success story there around um, what it means to engage donors when you can't do the thing that they are used to loving you for. And as you're dreaming about Bard in, in the future, what do the audience trends help you think about in terms of strategy and plans and budgets? Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, and hi, everyone. Nice to be with you. Um, I am Claire Sakaki. I am the executive director of Bard on the Beach, which is located in Vancouver on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, 
and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, we are a 31-year-old Shakespeare Festival. We offer about 200 plus performances over a four month period every summer, um, as well as year round uh, community engagement programming. Uh, for us, conversations about patron attendance and donor behavior is of great interest, as I know it is to so many of you, as over 90% of our almost $9 million budget comes from tickets and private donations. So yes, to answer Camilla's question, um, as a summer festival, we do have a limited amount of time to engage with our patrons um, over the summer. So it was important to us that we moved quickly to find alternative ways to engage when we normally would. Obviously moving to digital programming allowed us some flexibility, but it was uh, still really important to us that we kept our season intact as much as possible. Um, so early on, we assumed a trend similar to the NANOS findings um, in terms of reduced donations for 2020. Um, and so first of all, we, we actually worked with our design firm to rebrand ourselves. I mean, our name says where we are, and we obviously are not there this summer. So um, we rebranded ourselves in 2020 as Bard Beyond the Beach, along with a new temporary logo. Uh, instead of the tent, it's now a little house as people engage with us from their homes. And we went even further with that, with a sub-brand for our donor activities, which was Bard in Your Heart. We created a, a slate of uh, events that mirrored donor levels. So higher donation levels gave access to higher engagement level activities. And all of the events were, were really inspired by what they would have received, what they would have ac had access to this summer. Um, so for example, um, a benefit that all of our donors get offered are backstage tours every year. Um, we were able to transition that into a digital backstage tour of our costumes, deeper dive into the design process, that sort of thing. Um, and then right up to our most generous donors, we, we do an annual dinner on stage with bespoke content. Um, and we're doing the exact same this year, just from people's homes. So next week we're delivering uh, meals and wine to all of our uh, higher end donors. We're all logging on at the same time and we've created an hour of pre-recorded and live entertainment for the event. Um, we've also been able to transition on a number of our, our corporate sponsor activities, our, our wine sponsor, uh, we've been able to offer our pre-show wine tasting events virtually. So again, a win-win with uh, we are able to fulfill sponsor obligations while offering another vehicle to have people engage with us over the summer. And we've just offered so many events all summer for our donors. Digital analytics have been very promising. Um, engagement levels have been very high and the retention for these events, which was actually quite surprising to us, has been almost 100%. So people have kept with us. Anecdotally, our development team has received many calls thanking us for, for the events and we've been able to also use them as acquisition tools. Um, while obviously not as, as effective as uh, live performances, we have been able to offer access to encourage donations and have seen quite a significant uptake. Um, and to reinforce these activities, we've done a few things. Um, we have offered, uh, we've produced a digital house program, thanking our sponsors, donors, um, and just marking the year. Um, obviously minimal design costs, we don't have any printing costs, um, but we were able to offer just another touch point for, for our donors. Um, simply, we just ensured that all of the information out in the world was very specific to this summer. So we didn't want to reinforce um, activities that they weren't going to have access to or benefits that they would not have access to. Um, and we really wanted to highlight what we were able to offer. Um, and then finally, a small but but meaningful activity is that we created um, the donor branded Bard in Your Heart branded merchandise. Um, so many of our loyal donors wanted something tangible to mark the season. Um, and so we wanted to offer that. Mm -hmm. I think um, those are really inspiring ideas for people on the call to think about as we're kind of heading into a, for many of us heading into a season that is going to be disruptive. I'm going to take get you the to do the the shortest possible answer to that second part, which is when you look at the nanos data and the fact that these numbers around masks and social distancing are not necessarily budging over the three months of the pandemic, and when we look forward to to to, to the numbers growing in many markets across the country, how does it how, how does it inform your planning for next year? Well, it's tough for us because unlike many of my colleagues who are trying to offer a performance season this fall, we're actually looking to 2021. So while some of this information is encouraging, um, we are anxious that people are responding to how they feel now. And six months from now, there may be a different set of uh, parameters. So for those of you that know me, you know I am the eternal optimist. But, uh, you know, in BC, we've had COVID, murder hornets, the wildfire smoke, the once in 20 year moth infestation, and now a snap election. Um, but I will remain optimistic in that I think 
people are still willing to come back immediately, which is very promising. A very small percentage of folks are saying that they're not going to come back at all. Of course, we don't want that number to register at all, but all things considered, I remain hopeful. God bless you and, and the murder hornets. If you could just keep them on the British Columbia coast, that would be fantastic for the rest of us. Um, and our final panelist is Jane. Jane is joining us from our nation's capital and she, I'm gonna get you again, Jane, to try and squish in two quick answers so we can jump into the question portion of today. I know there's some questions that are getting ranked up. Um, the NEC, of course, has a national donor base. And I wonder if you can just give us maybe one beautiful story about how you're keeping those donors connected in this time when they can't get to Ottawa and you can't necessarily get to them. Maybe you're not able to deliver wine like um, a Bard on the Beaches. And second, you know, as organizations are thinking about long-term strategy through and beyond COVID, I know that the NEC and your strategic plan has a focus on sector recovery. I'm wondering how data and donors are informing that work. So I'm going to give you the, that large question and three minutes Stance, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I'm Jane Watson. I'm the CEO of the National Arts Center Foundation. Uh, we work to support the work of Canada's National Arts Center, which is located in Ottawa on unceded Algonquin um, territory. So uh, I think, like many um, of you on the call today, we have been engaging with our donors um, on a regular basis. And I think the best way, of course, is your email contact and um, you know, you're doing Zoom meetings with donors and you're reaching out to them with handwritten notes and all kinds of levels of engagement. But the best way to um, engage with your donors is to show them your relevance, demonstrate your relevance, and show them what you're doing. Jane, can I just pause you for 10 seconds? We're just having some consistent garbling issues on the sound. I wonder if there's, uh, I can't imagine there's an IT person in your living room who can assist. No. <laughs> is it best if I speak slower? Um, Jane, I think if you have any recording playing, if you have the live stream up, that might be an issue, anything of that sort. Alternately, um, maybe if you turn off your video, that might help. Turn off the video, sorry about that. Is that any better? It's very slightly better. I don't know if you can find a pair of headphones maybe with that. Apologies. Um, we're we're um, listening to a technological, technological situation. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, you can't hear me. It sounds a little like you're at the bottom of a large well, which I suspect is not the message we want to be sending right now from the National Arts Center. So I think um, Very sorry. that's okay, Jane. We have uh, been all day and it's parking, so I'm not sure what's up with me now. <laughs> Do you want to do you want to maybe leave the call and come back? Um, that might help. That's we're getting some tech um, support from our from our chat. Um, or maybe I'll let you and uh, and the business for the arts team for that. Out. Okay, Jane, Jane, you can also try to phone in. And we can maybe move forward with the live Q and A, and then Jane, if you can connect after, try phoning in, and we'll get back to your questions. Let's go with that. So thank you so much, and thank you to everybody for your patience. So Monica, I think I'm Monica from Business for the Arts. I think I'm punting over to you to help us um, to handle some of the questions, and maybe we invite our panelists, and I'll assign as helpful. Yeah, and then as soon as we see Jane hop back in, I'll pass it over to her. Okay, so our first question comes from John Weiss, and the question is, this conversation is heavily focused on the nonprofit sector. But the data that Nick presented applies, with the exception of donation numbers, also to a very large for-profit live performance sector that puts thousands of artists to work every year. Has anyone caught wind of creative ideas or best practices pertaining to the for-profit sector? It's a great question, and I don't think it's something that we've thought about in the context of this. You know, so often when Business for the Arts gathers, it's its members, it tends to be, or its colleagues, it tends to be in the not-for-profit world. Monica, did you want to take this one? Monica Estevez? Monica Estevez? <laughs> um, that's a tough one because um, I, I would be speculating and, and just hearing from, from the rumor will mill and from colleagues. Um, but but sure, I, I, I have heard from others who run for-profit and commercial theaters um, that they're looking into pretty substantial investments um, in different types of cleaning and sanitization uh, technologies and HVAC technologies that for the rest of us in the not-for-profit world, we would uh, uh, just simply don't have 
the, the, the resources, you know, this is, this, this is HVAC systems in the millions of dollars. Um, that type of investment is not one that certainly our organization would consider at this point. Um, that's something that I've heard. Camilla, you might have, a, have, have heard something from others. Well, it's interesting. My, my, my sense right now from the is that in, so much of this is being driven out of the, the commercial piece is being driven out of um, the insurance risks. And so I'm not sure that very many of them have been able to kind of get that hurdle sorted before um, they can really start to innovate. I suspect that our um, colleagues in those worlds are, are really looking at investments, as Monica said, around digital. And I suspect they're also just have longer windows to wait and to shrink in, in those times before they can regain. I mean, it's hard to imagine major, major festivals um, coming back uh, without rethinking how they produce the art, how they um, gather people safely. Um, I would encourage people if in your marketplace, there's a folk festival, you know, that's an organization in Winnipeg that's making a lot of great strides in terms terms of retaining engagement and retaining um, a real uh, connection to its audiences and its uh, volunteer base at a time when they can't necessarily do the one thing that they really love, which is go to a park and listen to folk music and sweat on each other. So I don't have a great answer to that, but um, but hopefully that's a piece. Next up, next question, Monica. Yep. Our next question is concerning government matching funds. So the question is, have any jurisdictions advocated to the governments for perhaps matching funds where the government matches every dollar donated. Um, Irfan, can you think of a situation to uh, around that? Um, I haven't seen a, a lot on that, but I do think the idea of some kind of either or match or a credit or something, I think is valuable. I have seen some other survey data. I mean, the whole point of this actually is to get the sentiment of the population to decide how we're gonna to get to the other side. And so I've seen some other survey data that says that donors are more interested in giving more and would consider giving more, like two X uh, the number. So 40% of people would consider giving more money to charity with a tax incentive versus 20% uh, if it was just matched. And so I think there's something in that. Uh, you know, the number one thing that I think we're seeing in Nick's survey here is that Canadians care about the arts, want to vote with their dollars for it, if they had the capacity, they would give more. And so I think it's impossible for government to ignore the citizens. I mean, 75% of Canadians say they've gone to the arts. They're part of this survey. So 75% of Canadians are saying, this matters to us. And if we could do more, we would. So please encourage us to do it. Yeah, I also think about the endowment match that has been prevalent in the performing arts for a number of years and really contributed in a major way to the success of performing arts organizations in building their endowment. And really uh, the great the great story on that has been able to say to donors, your gift goes further. We, we are getting an 87 cent match on the dollar. Um, I know that that program uh, has been renewed, was renewed at some point, but you know, there is a, there's a model there where success begets success. I agree. And I think, I mean, I've seen community foundations doing some things like this, but, you know, the pool of total capital that's available if the government comes alongside us is substantially greater than if, you know, small organizations or community foundations put up their capital to match. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do we have time for another question or two? Oh, perhaps we've got Jane back. Yeah. Is the sound any better? Oh my goodness. We so much, so much clearer. We can't <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm not sure. Can you? I don't know if you can see me, but um, I'm happy to uh, to give it a, a go again. Okay, so right. you, you had asked about um, how to keep our donors engaged. So the best way that we have found has been, of course, demonstrating our relevance. And so that meant connecting our donors with programs like Canada Performs, which was our emergency relief fund that we started up at uh, the beginning of the pandemic to pay Canadian artists uh, to perform out of their living rooms. So that was a terrific way. Uh, to engage um, with our donors and, and demonstrating, frankly, our, our value proposition. You asked about how data is driving our decisions going forward, Camilla. Um, we saw from the data that the performing arts, live performing arts is going to be the most hardest hit and um, will frankly be the last to return in terms of opening. And so it was very um, important for us to um, understand that. And so the decisions that the National Arts Centre has taken uh, in terms of its strategic direction has been to pivot to make decisions um, around how to support sector recovery. So for the next three years, the NEC strategic plan, the next act, all decisions that are gonna be taken will be about how will this benefit the live performing arts sector? What can we do um, to improve conditions for artists and arts 
organizations across the country. And so one thing, uh, to, an example is a project we're doing right now being funded through the foundation is Grand Acts of Theatre, where we're funding 12 theatre companies across Canada to do live socially distance um, performing arts um, activities that respond to the crisis and artistic response to the crisis. And we're uh, filming those and we're gonna collect those and then we're gonna send those out um, virally in a good way, <laughs> Vir viral in a, in a good way. And so, um, you know, that has been um, a driving force in terms of looking at that, that type of data, that it will be um, a longer term haul in terms of re returning folks to um, the, um, the venues, the dance, the theater, the orchestra uh, communities where we all value that communal experience um, so much. No, thank you so much, Jane. That's really inspiring. We've all been watching the NAC's uh, Canada performance with, with great glee over these early days. Um, can I just ask, you know, we, we, we were just answering a question before you were able to jump back on about sort of the value of match. Has this been something that the NAC has seen in your really, you know, extraordinary scope of fundraising that really when there's a match it, it, or when there's a, an incentive program, it really does kind of lift all those boats? Absolutely. And just on a small scale example, we couldn't hold our annual fundraising gala um, like many of, uh, of people on the call today. So a major event like that. So we uh, we went to a longstanding donor and said, you know, would you match the proceeds of what we're able to raise up to a certain maximum? And, and that was very powerful. The donor agreed to do that. And so that was very powerful to go back out to folks who were considering buying uh, or taking part in our stay home with, we're calling it stay home with event. And so we were able to say, if we reach a certain threshold, this will kick in. And so that was extremely motivating, I think, for a lot of people to want to participate. So I'm grateful for our donors for, for being with us. Thank you so much. Okay, Monica, can we do one more question before I put it, we, we close this down? Maybe it's- Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention too, in regards to that matching fund question asked earlier, double check and see that ArtsVest is available in your community as well. That's one that'll offer you some matching funds if you're eligible and it's there. Um, our next question comes from Vincent Post. And the question is curious about the idea of fixed costs being high in performing arts and culture. Is there any data that, so, that shows comparatively across other sectors and industries? That's a great question. Um, I'm tempted to share it between Irfan and Claire. I'm curious if you, as organized people who are staring down, you know, visual arts and performing arts organizations, if you just want to address that kind of fixed cost question. Yeah, I mean, I can maybe uh, start if that's okay, uh, Claire. And I'll make, sorry, Camilla, I'll make it super short. Um, I'll give you an example at Glenbow, and uh, Claire, you can talk about uh, Bard, obviously, but like. For us, we can only have so many people come into our art museum, just given physical distancing limitations with, with COVID, but we can't turn on half of the security. Like either they're all there, it's actually securing the collection or they're all not there. Uh, the rent is either paid or not paid. And if you looked at this versus like, think about online businesses, right? If you or you sell a good um, uh, or, or a service, there's a lot more variability in your cost. It's not so binary. And so in our sector, more than probably more than half of us, maybe all of us have those kind of binary investments that are large that we need to make to even to even be in the business. Yeah, and I think particularly, Claire, you know, there's a tent or there isn't a tent. Well, that is definitely our challenge is that some of you know, we actually build our theaters every year. And so for us to do any performances as we normally would now, again, we're all learning how to be more nimble than we've ever felt comfortable. But um, but definitely for us to to even perform anything, we would need to make at least a million dollar investment in building our facility and then then the production costs actually start after that. So so it is very challenging. But again, if, if anything has taught me this summer is we, we need to rethink on how we do our business. And that is something that I am always inspired by. And if not this summer, I don't know when. Thank you so much. Um, I think that is the cue to sort of wind this down. I wanted to just very briefly thank the extraordinary Business for the Arts team, but also the our ASL interpreter today, who's done an extraordinary job. I'm going to turn it over to Paul Genet for final comments and thanks. And I just wanted to thank Paul Genet, our Business and Arts board member, for being a title sponsor and making this series happen. So thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. 
Paul's coming. <laughs> Paul knows how to make it. There All right, is it working? There you go. Thank you. Sorry, in a remote location, I struggle to get my internet sometimes. Um, uh, Kamala, un grand merci, un grand merci à toi également, Monica. Je m'appelle Paul Genet, je suis un uh, membre de l'équipe de uh, Power Corporation of Canada. My day job is with Power Corporation, and uh, I also am a member of the Board of uh, Business uh, for the Arts. And uh, just uh, want to say a, a, a huge thank you to all the panelists and to Nick. Um, uh, we're really pleased and proud to have been able to sponsor this series and uh, what a remarkable series uh, it has been. Uh, Nicole Anderson asked if we would do it and it has exceeded uh, our hopes and dreams by a long shot, over 20 sessions. And uh, you know, today's, uh, today's session was uh, yet another remarkable example. I've been scribbling notes furiously um, and perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the uh, creative community in Canada uh, would be so full of uh, striking ideas and uh, been able to pivot so well and uh, uh, full recognition on the part of uh, donors like ourselves that uh, that it is a challenge it is a it is a struggle um, but really this um, uh, COVID-19 has uh, has shown the best I think of the Canadian spirit where I've seen other polling that has said Canadians have been brought closer together through the experience of trying to deal with all of this and I think uh, and that's not been true in all other other, you know, number of other jurisdictions, uh, unfortunately, um, but I think we're seeing the best of Canada and the best of uh, Canadian arts and culture. If you would allow me, um, uh, Kamala, just to share one hopeful story, I'm also, uh, uh, along with some of the others that we've heard, um, the National Gallery of Canada, I sit on the foundation board, and the gallery under Sasha Suda's leadership asked if the foundation would pay, once they reopened, for the first 25,000 uh, visitors, uh, so there would be free admission. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that this this worked. It was a draw, and notwithstanding the, uh, the, the absent tourist season in Ottawa, um, local new um, patrons filled in the gap and uh, they are at the same numbers that they were at in the same period, uh, six, six week period last year uh, since they uh, they reopened. So um, there are really bright spots uh, here and certainly the panelists today, Wesley, uh, Irfan, Monica, um, uh, as uh, well as uh, Claire and uh, Jane, uh, we're able to share some really encouraging things. So um, uh, a great salute to the creativity that's being brought and the generosity that's been brought. Uh, Nick, you gave us some great insights as well that I think will be useful in terms of uh, arts organization, knowing their audience, know the appetite and take a lot of hope too. There clearly seems to be an appetite to get back there. It's tougher for uh, performing arts than it is for say art uh, gallery and museums right now. Um, but uh, I take a, away a lot of hope, a lot of encouragement, and uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, rekindled for uh, for the great arts and culture community in, uh, in, in Canada. It's just amazing. So uh, over to you, Kamala. Thanks again. Uh, just delighted to uh, to be able to participate and support this, uh, this uh, series. Un grand merci. Thank you so much. And I'm going to throw it back to Maggie Fairs for any final things that we've forgotten. We've been very blessed to have great people on the call today. Thank you for all participating, for sending your questions. And we'll keep this uh, live link open for just a few minutes if there's any lingering pieces. Maggie? Thanks so much, Camilla. And thank you so much for everybody for joining us today. As Camilla said, we're going to keep the chat box open. So uh, we, we will you'll be able to share your comments and your thoughts. We've also live, so we've also have this on YouTube and we're also recording it. So it'll be on the Business and Arts website over the course of the next couple of days. I do want to take an opportunity to thank Irfan, Irfan Raji and Christine Armstrong for their partnership and for uh, making the research possible that Nick shared with us today. So thank you very, very much for that on behalf of all of the arts community. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I wish you a lovely afternoon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.